Good morning. morning. How are we doing this morning? You know, I got to hand it to you. It's the long weekend. It's raining outside. It's the middle of summer. And we packed out the room. (laughs) Like, Like the... Yeah, you all get to go to heaven <laughs> because you showed up to church. You know what's funny? I've made that exact joke like 20 times, and some of you still laugh. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Well, uh, welcome, uh, really, everyone. It's so good to have you with us this morning. We are continuing on in this uh, summer teaching series called Summer Soundtrack. Uh, just before I get into that, I, I wanted to highlight something that's uh, really special in our Uh, church family. Uh, We are now one month away uh, from our large 100-year centennial celebration as a church. Yeah, yeah. It is going to be, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. September 8th, 9th, and 10th. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We have an entire weekend of festivities. On the Friday nights, the family fun and fireworks. The Saturday night is the gala. In Sunday, oh, I don't even know how we're going to get everyone in here, but we're going to have fun uh, honoring the past, looking forward to the future. Uh, two things, just really quick. The first, the Friday night, uh, the family fun night with fireworks. Uh, several of you have signed up to help. Uh, we are still in need of about 30 more volunteers uh, to pull off this event. So uh, if you're available, help us. Sign up. Go to our website, parkwoodwindsor.com. Scroll down. Uh, to the centennial section. Just click on there. It'll help you. Uh, Please help us with that. About 30 people. The second thing is the gala on the Saturday night. Tickets are for sale and they're filling up fast. Uh, I believe it's $45 um, a person uh, per per ticket for the event. It's going to be a great night. You might even see me wear a suit and that's worth 45 bucks uh, right there. Uh, but go on the website. It's all in the same section, and uh, we're going to celebrate, uh, and it's going to be great. But that is one month away. All right. You ready to get into it? Okay. Um, summer soundtrack. If you're new, kind of just hopping in maybe this weekend, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're just kind of anchoring ourselves down in the book of Psalms. Now, what makes the Psalms a hard book to anchor down in, is it's a collection of 150 different songs, poems, and prayers. And uh, so I said this last week, we could literally be in this series for three years if we just did one a week. So uh, instead of that, what we're doing is we're looking at different categories of psalms. So far, we've looked at psalms of praise, psalms of petition, psalms of peace, psalms of pilgrimage, psalms of pain, and today... We're going to be looking at Psalms of Prophecy. Psalms of Prophecy, this teaching series has been brought to you by the letter P. (laughs) We're sticking right with it all the way to next week. But uh, there's just certain Psalms that undeniably have a prophetic edge to them. And and I'm not just talking about uh, foretelling, I'm talking about foretelling. Like there are Psalms that predict things uh, to come that haven't happened yet. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at, hands down, my, my favorite one, uh, and that's Psalm chapter 22. So if you have a Bible, let's go Psalm 22. Now here's what you need to know about Psalm 22 before we start. Um, it was written by King David, but this psalm, unlike many of the other psalms that he wrote, uh, is not ultimately about him. Uh, like, it, it kind of starts that way, and you kind of make that argument, but, but most theologians agree that actually the further you go into this psalm, the deeper you go into it, it kind of becomes clear that, that this wasn't really about him at all. In fact, we, we kind of know that several of the things that David wrote in this psalm, he never experienced. And, and the reason why is that it, it's not ultimately about him. Psalm 22 is actually... Um, he, he was writing about someone who was to come. What, what, what makes Psalm 22 so absolutely amazing is that it clearly points to Jesus. Or many could argue that maybe it's the other way around, that Jesus so clearly points to it. There is an unmistakable connection 
between the two. In fact, look at this. Charles Spurgeon, if you don't know who he is, he was called the Prince of Preachers. Uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, was one of the most effective pastors in the last 2,000 years of the church age. Like, the, the guy was just a machine. And he wrote this about this psalm. Spurgeon said that we should read reverently, putting off our shoes from off our feet as Moses did at the burning bush. For if there be holy ground anywhere in Scripture, it is in this psalm. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's a profound thing to say. And so, like, what, what's he even saying here? I, I, I think what Spurgeon is saying is that when we get into Psalm 22, th- there is something just like uniquely holy and God ordained with these words. And because of that, we should tread lightly. Because of that, we, we shouldn't rush in and rush out. Uh, because of that, we, he actually says that in the same way that Moses took off his sandals to kind of prepare himself to approach the burning bush, we should similarly, we should prepare our hearts before encountering these words. So that's what I want to do. Before we go any further in, I just want to pray for a moment. And, and, and I just want to have a, just a time where we can kind of center our hearts and our minds uh, that we wouldn't just rush in. We wouldn't just run to the burning bush this morning, but, but rather we would, we would prepare ourselves. So let's pray. Lord God, right now, Lord, as we approach a unique psalm, Lord, as we approach a psalm that so clearly Jesus wanted us to know, God, I pray that we wouldn't rush in. God, I I pray this morning, Lord, that we would prepare our hearts and our minds. Lord God, right now, Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to your church this morning through this word. Be with us, Lord God, and Jesus, would you be praised in it all. We ask this in your name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. All right. Psalm 22, Psalm of Prophecy. Uh, Very unique psalm. In in fact, I was reading this one guy. He listed 27 unique prophecies in this chapter that Jesus fulfills. 27. So my sermon this morning has 27 points. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Um, actually, what, what most people do is instead of going through every nuanced piece, and that's one way of teaching it, uh, most people agree that actually there's kind of three big sweeping categories in this psalm. And so historically, this is how uh, the, the church has taught it. And so I, I want to kind of follow that theme because I, I think it's so good. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at three kind of large prophecies that David makes about Jesus. The first one is this, that David prophesies about the abandonment of Jesus. If you just go with me into verse uh, 1 and 2, listen to these words. The psalm starts this way, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Any... Anything there sound familiar? Like, it should. This here is a verbatim Jesus' quote from the cross 1,000 years after David penned it. Look, look with me. I'll, I'll just take you there. Matthew 27, 46. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, it says about 3 in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what's really interesting, actually? You go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You go all four Gospels, and you look at the crucifixion accounts. Uh, What's fascinating is that Jesus is constantly talking about other people. Like when he's on the cross, he's uh, going through the suffering. These women come up, and they're weeping, and Jesus says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. He, he, he turns to the crowd. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, right? Uh, to the thief on the cross, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. To Mary and John, this is now your mother. This is now your son. Like, he's, he's constantly thinking about and talking and addressing other people. And all of that was true up until this moment. And something changes. 
And Jesus echoes out the words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which begs the question, man, like, what's with the sudden change? Why is Jesus saying this? Why is he saying these words? Well, there's two reasons. There's two reasons why. The first is this. Jesus was citing Psalm 22. You have to understand, um, like the scriptures, like we know them today with chapters and verses and all that stuff, that didn't exist at Jesus' time. In fact, it was the year 1571 when AD, when we added all of that in to make the scriptures more usable, manageable. Okay, At the time of Jesus, there were no chapters, there were no verses. So what you would do when you come to the scriptures, and if you oftentimes you wanted to kind of bring people somewhere, you wanted to bring them to a certain chapter or a book, you would quote the first line. That, that's like the same thing as us saying, well, turn with me today to Psalm 22. Like they didn't have that. So, so, so what they would do is they'd quote the first thing. When Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's speaking over the people that were there and also to all of humanity to say, go back and read Psalm 22. I am the fulfillment of it. Every word in this chapter is happening right now. My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? He's, Jesus is, is making this connection that Psalm 22 points to him. In order to do that, he points back to it. Are, are you with me this morning? You, you getting this? So that's the first thing that Jesus was doing when he said this, but it's not the only thing. The second thing, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is that he was expressing what was actually happening. You see, the, the, the cross for Jesus meant ultimate abandonment. Friends, family, ultimately his father in heaven, he was absolutely alone. What's actually interesting, um, he cries out, my God, my God. This is the one and only time that Jesus will do this. You go back, look at it. Every single other time that Jesus references God, he calls him Father. There is 165 references to Jesus calling God Father, and this is the only one where he calls him God. Why? <laughs> because this is the cry of broken fellowship. Jesus, in this moment, was experiencing what sin does. And sin, ultimately, what it does is it separates us from the Father. You have to kind of go here, because this is actually devastating. Jesus Christ was actually momentarily separated from the Father so that you and I will never have to be. Ever. Ever. Like, we, now, we may go through life and we may experience moments where it feels like God is a million miles away. We may experience moments where it feels like God has abandoned us, but, but that, that's all it is. It's a feeling. Because in reality, God will never abandon us. He will never leave us because Jesus was. Jesus went through it so that we don't have to. It's what theologians call the great exchange which is a multi-layered thing, but it's Jesus going in our place, experiencing the pain, the loneliness, the hardship, so that we don't have to. Jesus on the cross, man, it is a devastating picture here, but it's what happens. And all of it, this abandonment, all of this was prophesied 1,000 years before Jesus even came into the world. 1,000 years before David wrote about what would happen. But it's not the only prophecy that David makes. The second one is not just about the abandonment of Jesus. David prophesies about the anguish of Jesus. Psalm 22 goes on um, to say very specific things about the way in which Jesus would suffer in the events around him. Like, let's just read some of this, okay? Listen to verse 7 says, all who seek me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Uh, go down with me to verse 14. 
David writes, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. Watch this. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. You see, this is what I meant. As we go further into this psalm, it's becoming clear this is not really about David. Right? Like for all we know, uh, David's bones were never pulled out of joint. For for all we know, when it comes to David, um, uh, people didn't strip him of his clothes and then gamble for them. And for all we know of David, he he never had his hands and his feet pierced. In fact, get this, crucifixions, the death where they they pin you to a cross and they nail uh, in your hands and your feet, that wouldn't even be invented for another 500 years after David wrote this which begs the question, what's happening here? Why would David even write these words? Honestly, I don't know. Like, like what was in David's mind when he wrote, they pierced my hands? I don't know what was in his mind other than to say that clearly the Holy Spirit was leading him to, to write them. Because it was almost exactly a thousand years after he wrote them that all of it with like pinpoint precision comes true in the person of Jesus. When, when David writes, all who seek me mock me, and they walk by and they, they kind of wag their heads, well, this is Luke 18, 32. This is exactly what Jesus said. No, this is what's going to happen when I'm on the cross. Or, or how about when, when David writes, my mouth is dried up and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Think about Jesus' words on the cross when he echoed out in extreme dehydration, I thirst. Or how about, they divide my garments and cast lots for my clothing. Well, that's Luke 23, 34. In fact, what's interesting here is it was customary at that time that when somebody was being crucified, that they would get the the clothes of the person who was dying, and then they would give the clothes over to the family members. But for some reason, on this day... (laughs) When Jesus was being died, they didn't do that. In fact, the soldiers did exactly what Psalm 22 said they would do. They gambled and cast lots for Jesus' clothing. Or when David writes, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is John 20, 27. You see, David not only prophesied about Jesus' abandonment, he, he prophesied about Jesus' anguish. This week, kind of midweek, um, or last week, I went back and I watched um, the movie, The Passion of the Christ. I haven't watched this in, uh, oh man, it's probably been seven or eight years. Um, But one of the reasons why I went back, just when I was kind of studying through this text, is um, I, I think the one thing that, that that movie does a good job of is it shows the agony of the cross. Um, Literally, it's where the word crucifixion means. It's it's like excruciating. It's where we get that word from. Like, and when I was studying this week, I I didn't just want to stand up here and like teach you. I I, I wanted to feel it. (laughs) And that movie just does a good job of helping me feel it. And I got to be honest, I... I, d- I didn't expect it or see it coming, but there was, there was at least two different moments when I was watching this movie that I just had to push the pause button and breathe. Like, just breathe. And it wasn't because of how gory it is. My stomach can handle that. Um, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't, it went to the, like, like, what was breaking me as I was watching this is that this is Jesus, like, well, actually, it's Jim Caviezel. <laughs> Playing, you get my point. <laughs> but you go into it, and it's like, 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 like people experience anguish in life. 
But there's something unique about the anguish that Jesus experienced. That it wasn't just physical. Like Jesus suffered emotionally. Jesus suffered mentally. Jesus suffered physically. Like when Jesus was in the garden and he cries out three times, uh, let this cup be passed from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Like what's going on there? Because I can point you historically to Christians who have actually died similar deaths to Jesus and they didn't break a sweat. So was, was Jesus like weaker than them? No. What Jesus had to go through on the cross was something unparalleled. To anybody, any other death in human history, Jesus not only died and experienced anguish, but Jesus bore the weight of our sin. Amen. That creates a certain level of anguish that none of us in this room will ever experience. Jesus wasn't just abandoned, man. Jesus suffered. And David wrote about it. A thousand years before. Pinpoint precision. Saying, this is what's going to happen. This man who's going to come, he's going to be abandoned by God. This man who's going to come, he's going to experience deep pain, deep anguish. But David's not done prophesying. Talks about the abandonment, the anguish, and we'll close off with this. He talks about, lastly, the accomplishment of Jesus. You see, Jesus wasn't just abandoned, and he didn't just suffer. Come on, how many people know Jesus accomplished something on the cross? <laughs> like he accomplished something. But let's be real, okay? It didn't look like it. Like in this moment, Jesus hanging on the cross, this made him look like an absolute failure. Imagine being one of Jesus' disciples, one of the guys that you've given up your life to follow this man. You've given up everything, your career, like everything to follow Jesus. And now this man that you believe was like the hope of humanity has been betrayed by a kiss, uh, by a kiss. He's been flogged and beaten repeatedly. He's been nailed to a cross. And then he cries out, out loud, God, you've left me. Does this not look like failure? But what looked like failure on the outside was not. This was actually Jesus' greatest accomplishment. For it was in this moment that Jesus purchased humanity's salvation. I want to take us one more time into Psalm 22. Psalm 22 ends, um, David's pointing to the greatness of this suffering servant, uh, Jesus, and also how awesome it's going to be for those of us who put our trust in him. So let's, let's go to verse 26. This is how the psalm ends. It says, The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. No, oh, come on, just take that in. Jesus rules over the nations. Doesn't matter who the earthly leaders are ultimately because God is king. He's king. Verse 29 says, All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will, will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will, they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn that he has done it. He's done Done what? <laughs> he, the suffering servant, the man who was abandoned, the man who was in anguish, he, that guy, has done it. That guy has purchased our salvation. 
that guy has made a way where there seems to be no way. I mean, think about how close the line is. Psalm 22 ends with, he has done it. Some of Jesus' last words on the cross, it is finished. There was an accomplishment on the cross. What looked like failure was not. Jesus purchases our salvation. And I love the line here. It says that, and it's so great what this man is going to do. This is what David says, that that future generations are going to talk and tell to a people not yet even born about how great he is. Harkwood, we are those people. We are those people. We are the people that weren't even born yet when this happened. David's prophecy is not just that he's going to be abandoned. It's not just that he's going to be in anguish. It's not just that he accomplished something. David prophesies about the message about this man. And he says, this message and this man is so great that it is going to carry on from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation without fail. That's a bold prophecy. Psalm 22 is coming true right now. In this moment, this prophecy is happening right now. Now, we are the future generations declaring one message. He's done it. He's done it. (laughs) He made a way where there seemed to be no way. He did it. He gave his life. He did it. Like, I mean, this is our message. Our message is not, hey, church, you can do it. You're awesome. No. (laughs) Our message is he's done it. He's awesome. We don't look to our, we're not the hope. He's the hope. We look to him. It's Jesus. Can we stand up in this room? As I was writing this week, I was just thinking, man, like, how could David have known Maybe he didn't even know exactly what he's writing. Why? Why would David write these words? Why would he write about an abandoned man? Why would he write about the anguish of this man? Why would he write about the accomplishments of this man? Why would he write about future generations without end continuing to testify about the greatness of this man? Why? There's only one answer. God. God inspired David to write these words. And then 1,000 years after he wrote them, God entered the world. He put skin and bone on. He came in to die that death, to fulfill these words, and then to point back and make sure that we never miss them. Like, I I think it's important that we just kind of understand this morning, like God's not playing this large cosmic game of hide and go seek with us. Like, like, Like God wants you to know who he is. God wants you to know what he's done. God wants you to know his heart. God, God, he's not hiding from us. He's not running from us. God wants us to, to know who he is. In fact, just think about Jesus' words. Think about Jesus' words on the cross. The night that Jesus was, was betrayed, the night that all of this psalm was going to come true, Jesus says, don't you forget who I am. Don't forget about the abandonment. Don't forget about the anguish. Don't forget about what I'm about to accomplish. In fact, when you gather, remember. When you gather, this is so important. You need to actively, church, you need to remember who I am. This is, this is what Jesus does. He says, gather and remember what I've done. Remember who I am. It's Jesus saying, I am, I'm the man of sorrow. 
I'm the man who went through and experienced what you deserve. I'm that man. I'm that God. And so he calls us, don't ever forget it.